We need to be praying for as we preach this morning on uh, the need for us to take a stand with Israel. Amen. And we talked much about that this morning, but I just want to remind you tonight uh, that Jewish people all around the world tonight are, are at risk, and many of them are in fear. And uh, some of you are on Amir Sarfati's uh, 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 telegram, and he just put this out this afternoon. Uh, there were Jewish people travelling back to Russia. I don't know why they would want to do that, but you know, there's, there's a threat to their existence right now with this war going on. And uh, their plane left uh, Tel Aviv and they wanted to refuel in Dagestan, which is one of the uh, southern Russian nations, which is Islamic. And did you know that the people, they thought there were people in the hotel and they surrounded, these Muslim people surrounded the hotel because they heard there were Jews insane. And they actually brought people in, they went through the rooms to make sure there was no Jews there. And then they heard that the plane was landing and there was, looked like to me, there was hundreds of, right on, on a site right here, there was hundreds of them that went out to the airport to meet the planes. Because they, they heard there was Jews on the planes refueling going to Russia. And what would they do with them? I'm telling you, this is all around the world right now. And we need to be in prayer uh, for Jewish people and for their safety. And uh, stand with them wherever they may be. All right, well, at this time, we'll dismiss the young people to the, the youth fellowship this evening. And um, Brother Jeremy, as he leads that. And for the rest of us, we will turn, please, to the book of the Revelation, chapter number six. The book of the Revelation, chapter number six. And uh, we're glad to have visitors with us tonight. Thank you for coming. And we hope that you'll feel very welcome in our Bible study this evening. Now, for the last 18 years, we have been going through the New Testament. Uh, beginning in the book of Romans, uh, I guess we should have started maybe in Matthew, but we started with Paul's epistles and the book of Romans, and we're not now up through Revelation chapter 6, and tonight we're continuing our study in the book of the Revelation in our Bible study time, and uh, we looked already in chapter 6 at the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Um, we're going to kind of just do a little bit of review since we've been gone for a couple of weeks. And uh, usually we have charts and stuff, and we will have a whole lot more of that, but we don't have that tonight. Uh, but you will remember in the book of the Revelation, through uh, chapter 3, in chapter 1, I think it's verse 19, he gives us the outline of the book, the things that thou hast seen, the things that are, the things that shall be hereafter. And those things hereafter really began in chapter 4. Chapter 4 and chapter 5, uh, John is taken to heaven. And the throne room of God, what a wonderful study that is to see what uh, the throne room of God looked like and who is there. And of course the Father is there and the Lamb, the Lord Jesus is there. You have the four beasts which we believe are seraphim that surround the throne of God. And, and then you have the 24 elders which are representative of the church that has already been raptured, taken to heaven. Uh, those 24 elders take their crowns and they throw them at Jesus' feet. And they worship him. They worship him in chapter 4 as the creator. Uh, that he is worthy because all things were made by him and for him. And then when we get to chapter 5, they, they worship him as their redeemer. That thou hast redeemed us out of all the nations of the earth. So angels can't sing that song, but uh, the redeemed can. Now when we come to chapter 5, the end of that, we have... Um, as we come into chapter 6, chapter 5 introduces us to the scroll. And in that scroll, there are seven scenes. Not all along the first lip of the scroll, but there's one on the first lip. When that's broken, it's unrolled. And everything in the first seal has to be fulfilled. It has to be executed. In other words, the scroll is the plan of God for the end of this world. And that really... Um, uh, up to the time that Jesus comes and reclaims that which rightfully belongs to him. Satan will be evicted. The squatter will have to go. And the person who made us and bought us will come and establish his kingdom on the earth. But in order for that to happen, the seven seals have to be on seal. So after the second seal, and he rolls it out a bit more, there's a third seal. And that has to be broken and it rolls out a bit more. Now we've already looked at that. In chapter 6, the first four seals are the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And we find that here in Romans chapter 6, from verse 1 uh, down to uh, verse number 8. And that was our message last time. And those four seals, these are four judgments that are coming upon the earth. And the first one is the, the white horse, he that sat upon the white. He has a bow but no arrows. 
And uh, we interpret that as the, uh, the Antichrist who, becomes, who comes on the scene when the tribulation begins. In fact, it is he who begins the 70th week of Daniel when he makes a covenant with uh, the Jewish people. Not, just, not so much a peace covenant, but a covenant where they, whereby they are allowed to worship on the Temple Mount, that they will sacrifice on the Temple Mount. Three and a half years into that period of time, he causes that sacrifice and ablation to cease, so he breaks the covenant halfway through. So the Antichrist comes with diplomacy and peace, riding upon the white horse, victory, a man of great charisma and words, and the world will wonder after him. The world is seeking for a man to sort out all of their problems. They're seeking really for the Messiah, but unfortunately they accept the false Messiah, who is the Antichrist. And then we have the red horse, and that speaks about war. Peace is taken from the earth. I think the Antichrist is going to be involved in that too. He comes in peace, but uh, there will be wars and rumors of wars, Jesus said. And then because of war, there will be famine. The black horse speaks of famine and starvation of the masses. And of course, that is usually the outcome of war. And then the outcome of famine and starvation. The fourth uh, horseman, the fourth seal is death and hell follows death. So this is... Um, the unsaved uh, population of the world. And if you look down there in verse number 8, it says, And power was given unto them, that is death and hell, over the fourth part of the earth, to kill with the sword, with hunger, with death, and with the beasts of the earth. The Bible says, in that one judgment, in that one sealed judgment, that one quarter of the world's population will die. The world's population right now is 8 billion. So that would mean, if it happened right now, that 2 billion people would perish from the face of the earth. Interestingly, we saw last time, uh, that in chapter 9 on the fifth trumpet judgment, uh, that there is another judgment and one third of what's left of the population, one third will die. And so one third from six billion would be another two billion. And so between just those two judgments, half the world's population will not survive, um, really, uh, through the first half of the tribulation. There's other people that will die as well. People uh, look at the tribulation as something that's just a prophetic event. It is absolutely devastating yeah. to planet Earth. They have no idea. Uh, none of us, even when we read these things, we have no concept of how bad it will be. And I've said this before, and I'll say it again tonight. There are those who believe that the rapture happens at the end of the tribulation. I don't know why. Well, I won't get into all the detail of that. We've studied that before. We will study it again. But they have this idea that the church will go through. You'll hear them say the church is going through the tribulation. Can I say to you that if the church entered into the tribulation, most, the vast majority of the church would not come out on the other end. We would not go through the tribulation. We might go into the tribulation, but we would die in the tribulation. And you're going to see this in the fifth seal that we're going to look at tonight. And so the Bible always, for the believer, for the Christian, speaks of the rapture as a comfort. Comfort one another with these words. It is a blessed hope. And if you put the, the rapture at the end of the tribulation, and I've got to go through the tribulation in order to get the rapture, that's no comfort to me. I would rather die before the whole thing starts, if that's okay with you. But no, you see, the, the, the rapture is when Jesus comes for his bride. He comes for his ambassadors. You know, a country will always, uh, that's what they're doing right now in the Middle East. They're recalling their diplomatic staff. They're calling their ambassadors. They always do that before they start sending book bombs over. And God one day is going to start sending bombs on this planet. It's coming in judgment. The day of judgment is coming. Before the judgment comes, he calls his diplomatic staff. We are his ambassadors, ambassadors for Christ. He takes us home before he declares war on the world. And so tonight we're finishing chapter 6. And we're going to look at the last two seals in this chapter. Uh, chapter 6, it's easy to remember, has six seals. The seventh seal we don't get to until we get to chapter 8. So chapter 7 is a, it's a little um, um, cul-de-sac, it's a little um, a break from the storyline in some sense. We're introduced to some people, 144,000 Jewish witnesses. We'll look at that next time. And also, uh, we'll also look at the martyrs that it mentions as well in chapter 7. And then we'll get to chapter 8. And it's gonna, this is an exciting study. I've learned so much already. I'm looking forward to learning m many more things from it. So let's look tonight at chapter 6, and we're going to pick up the reading where we left off last time in verse number 9. Verse 9 is going to speak about uh, the fifth seal, uh, verse 9 through 11, verse 12 through verse 17 will be the sixth seal. So uh, seal 5 and seal 6 tonight. Verse number 9. 
And when he had opened the fifth seal, by the way, who is, who is it that opens the seals? It's Jesus. Okay, it's Jesus. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they had. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto them, uh, uh, every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest. Yet for a little season, until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. And I beheld when he opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of her, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her on timely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll, when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places, and the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man hid themselves, in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said unto the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? And dear Father, we pray and ask tonight that you'll be our teacher, that the Holy Spirit will lead us and teach us of things to come. And Lord, that you'll help us to understand the time in which we're living. Uh, Lord, this is not the end of the story, but... Uh, the end is coming, and help us, Lord, to be ready, for we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we see in verse 9 11, the fifth seal, and the fifth seal is, uh, speaks of the cry of the martyrs, the cry of the martyrs. And he says in verse uh, number 9, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Now, this altar would be in heaven. And these souls would be in heaven. These are souls in heaven who had been killed in the first half of the tribulation. The word slain there obviously means death, but put to death by violence. And they were, uh, that happened because of, their, because of the word of God and for their testimony. In other words, because of their message and their testimony uh, concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. The word testimony there means witness. It's the, the Greek word uh, maturia, where we get the word martyr from. Uh, we think of martyrs, always think about martyrs, well, it means somebody who dies for their faith. Uh, but the word martyr means a witness. It's somebody who dies for their faith, but they're proclaiming their faith Amen. as they die. And they're a witness to the truth of their faith as they die. Now, if you look over at chapter 12 of Revelation and verse number 7, you will see uh, others here who are still alive who have that testimony. And we have touched on this before, uh, but Revelation chapter 12, this is the middle of the tribulation period. And this is when the Antichrist turns on the Jewish people. And when there's, there's, there's great tribulation, Jesus said it's not, not to this time from the beginning of the world nor ever after. This is the worst time for the Jewish people, the last three and a half years of that seven year tribulation period. And so, and we could read the whole thing here, but if you look at chapter uh, 12, verse 7, and there was war in heaven, and Michael uh, and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. And so, in verse 11, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. Now, I believe that these are Jewish people who have actually received Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Many of the Jews are actually saved by the time of this, uh, this tribulation beginning. They're saved in the first half of the tribulation because you have 144,000 Jewish witnesses that witness right from the beginning of the tribulation and also the two witnesses that he mentions in chapter 11, which I think are um, Elijah and Moses, and Moses. We'll get to that later, of course, why I believe that. Uh, but there's two witnesses that witness, and what are they witnessing? They're, they're witness, witnessing of Christ. You remember that Moses and Elijah appeared to Jesus, Peter, James, and John on the Mount of Transfiguration, and they spoke to Jesus the things concerning his decease. They were speaking to Jesus that the things he was going to be facing very shortly at his crucifixion. So Moses and Elijah are very uh, critical concerning um, the, the end times. And so many, I think, believe on Christ uh, because of their witness. 
Um, and if you look down in verse number 17, it says uh, uh, that the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the, the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So when it speaks about that they, they suffered because of the word of God and their testimony, what testimony was it? It was their witness, their testimony of faith in Jesus Christ. And that's, the, that's what got them killed. Um, if you look over chapter 19 and in verse number 10, Again, we see <clears throat> this idea of testimony. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus, worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So there will be people saved in the tribulation period. You say, well, uh, well maybe if, I, you know, you know, if a person's not saved today and they hear this message, and they come to church and they hear the gospel and they say, well, you know, I think I'll just wait and if the rapture happens and I miss the rapture, well, I just go ahead and get saved right after the rapture. Well, there's a couple of problems with that. One is that if you miss the rapture, you're going into the tribulation and you probably won't survive it. That's why he says, he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. He's not speaking about spiritual salvation. He's speaking about staying alive. You have to endure through those seven years of literally hell on earth. Who would want to do that? But the more important point in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it says that if you hear the gospel in this time and uh, you reject the gospel, if you understand the gospel and you reject the gospel, then God will send you as a judgment, strong delusion that you will believe the lie that the Antichrist is the true Messiah, that you might be damned. That's a judgment of God upon people who understand the gospel in this time, willfully reject it. Um, if you do that, you're, when the rapture happens, you, you've just signed your death warrant. Now, we'll, we'll maybe get into some of the detail and we'll look at the Second Thessalonians chapter 2 in the future. But that's, uh, that's a problem. But the, the point is, there's many people in the world that do not understand the gospel, have never been presented with the gospel. And during the tribulation period, many of them will be saved. The Jews will be saved and many of the Gentiles will be saved. That's those who are the, the sheep in Matthew chapter 25. When he separates the sheep from the goats who are the sheep, well, they're saved Gentiles. When did they get saved? During the tribulation period. Now we ask the question, who are these people? In chapter, chapter 6, verse number 9. I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God. It's interesting that the altar is mentioned because when sacrifices were placed on the altar, their blood was drained and the blood was poured out at the base of the altar. And it kind of typifies what has taken place with these witnesses, these martyrs, in that they gave their lives for Christ and for the message of Christ. And their whole life was poured out like a sacrifice. Of course, Paul tells us in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. And all of us, whether we're martyred or not, should be willing to die. But we should also be willing to live. Amen. Some people say, well, I'm willing to die, but they're not willing to live. And you've got to be willing to live uh, if you expect to be willing to die as well. Well, who are they? Well, first of all, these people are not the church. They're not the church because the resurrection and rapture of the church, he had seen, has already happened. We're gone before the tribulation. That's typified with what you see in chapter 4, uh, verse number 1. Uh, these are the tribulation saints. And um, it's interesting also in verse 11, it says, And white robes were given unto every one of them. Now, we know that the church will be uh, red and white linen, white and clean. But when do we get our robes? When do we get our white linen, clean and white? Well, in Revelation 19, it says that his wife has made herself ready. This is at the end of the tribulation in heaven. And uh, by the way, we're there in, in glorified physical bodies. We're, we've got physical bodies, right? Because we're res the rapture is the resurrection. Uh, when our spirit, if you've already died, your spirit is reunited with a glorified body that comes up out of the earth. And then those of us who are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord, we get changed. We get a resurrection and a resurrection body without even dying. How about that? And so we get a body like Christ's glorified body. The Bible says we shall be like him. And uh, we will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the earth. So we're in heaven while the tribulation is going on on the earth. But we do not get our robes of white until Revelation 19, just prior to the second coming of Christ. So we get our robes at the end, but these people are getting their robes right in the middle. Now, the interesting thing here is this also, that, um, let me see if I'm, I'm where I'm supposed to be here. Sometimes I get ahead of myself. Yeah, I think I'm ahead of myself. Let's, um, 
Let me just mention, um, okay, let's look at uh, the second thing. We'll get to the ropes here in just a moment. Look at verse 10. What did they cry? This is the cry of the martyrs. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? You know, we've been reminded of what it is to be, uh, to be slaughtered, to, to die, to be slain. To die a violent death if you've been watching what has been taking place in Israel in these last three weeks. Of course, October 7th, uh, three weeks ago, uh, is when it took place. And we mentioned that this morning when I first heard about it. I thought, well, that's, that's a news. A hundred, a hundred Israelis uh, in terrorism being killed. And then later it was 1,400. And it's not just that they died. It's the way that they died. It was horrible. Uh, they were butchered. They were slaughtered. And to die a violent death like that, most people don't die like that. And it is, you know, obviously very concerning. And these martyrs were slain. They died that way. And they cried with a loud voice, How long? How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? You see, the Bible teaches us that innocent blood cries for justice. We get that... Just keep your place there and go to Genesis chapter uh, number 4 and verse number 10. The first person that was ever born in this world was a murderer. His name was Cain. And he killed his own brother Abel over a religious issue. And it says in, in verse number 10, when God approached Cain, he said, What hast thou done? What have you done? And that's a question some people will be asked. We could ask people today, I remember seeing an interview of, a, of one of the leaders of Hamas. And the interviewer was simply sitting there and he simply opened with the question, how can you justify people being slain in their beds at night, innocent men and women and children? You know what he did? He took the microphone off. He says, I'm not, I'm not standing for this. Yeah. And what hast I done? There's people that need to be asked that question. What have you done? And the God goes on to say to Abel, The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. Does, can blood cry? Well, in the ears of God, he says that blood, innocent blood, cries unto God for justice. We see this all through the Old Testament. And what the Old Testament teaches us, it is the government's job to require vengeance on innocent blood. And that's what's going on right now in Israel. Go please, if you would, to Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. Now, this whole idea, and we used to get this in Northern Ireland all the time. Sharon will remember this. And they would say this, well, an eye for an eye leaves everybody blind. And I, the eye for the eye thing, that's in the Bible, you know. And people um, say, well, that, that's, that doesn't, uh, that's not the right way to think about things. That's not, not the right way to go about it. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But that's Bible. Um, but when Jesus comes along and he says, um, when you're offended, when somebody you know, s smacks you on one side of the cheek, um, you, know, you don't smack them back, but you turn the cheek. There's two different things going on. You have to understand the context of uh, what, what is said and what context. When, G when the Bible speaks about an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, that's justice that is given to governments, not individuals. And so we should not take the law into our own hands. Now, we have the responsibility to defend ourselves. If you've got a gun in your house and somebody's breaking into your house to rob you or to hurt your family, you have not only the right, you have the responsibility. Mm -hmm. The responsibility to defend your wife and children and family. And you take your gun and you shoot them. If they're coming after you and they're going to harm you, you shoot them. Do you know that Jesus asked his disciples, how many swords have you? And they said, we've got two. And the Lord says, that's okay, it's enough. There was another place he says, go and sell your garment and buy a sword. Jesus said that. Because there is a biblical, godly responsibility for self-defense. Now, revenge is different. And the law reflects this. If somebody comes into your house and you shoot at them, and don't shoot, not shoot, but shout at them. <laughs> if, you, if you cry after them and say, get out of my house, and they realize you're there, and they turn their back and they're, they're trying to get out the window, they're trying, you are not allowed to go after them with your gun and shoot them in the back as they're climbing out through your window. You must let them go. Right. You see, vengeance is not ours. 
Vengeance belongs to God and God's ministers. And the ministers of God for vengeance is the government. And so the eye for the eye thing is not for you as an individual, but it is legitimate and it is given to government. And for us as individuals, we are to turn the cheek and we are to go the second mile. And we are to, uh, to, to give grace and mercy and turn things over to the Lord. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. But vengeance and self-defense are two different things. Now in Romans chapter 13, so this idea that uh, saying to Israel, well, an eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, leaves everybody blind, that's, that's, not, that, that's not biblical. And it's not what God wants. God says, when, um, if, and you get this in uh, Roman, uh, Genesis chapter 9, when God gave it to Noah, he says, if a man sheds man's blood, then by man shall that man shed his, his blood. Well, his life is forfeited. The Bible teaches capital punishment. If you go out and kill somebody, and you murder somebody, the Bible says capital punishment is what you, is what you deserve. A life for a life. Now, in Romans chapter 13, please, if you look, and we're talking about these souls under the altar, and they're crying, Lord, how long will it be before you judge and you avenge our blood? These souls are crying out for justice. Is that a wrong thing? It's not a wrong thing. It's a right thing. It's in the Bible. You think that God expects people to be slaughtered and slain and just to lay under and say, well, we just forgive you? No, let me tell you something. God is a God of justice. And there's a payment that has to be paid for that. Now, an individual could, whose murder can be forgiven in the sense that he can be saved, he can go to heaven when he dies, but he owes the price to society. And that's why even... Uh, men who have committed murder, who get saved, should still die. Because that's the penalty. Now in Romans chapter 13 verse 1 it says, Let every soul that be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. The powers that, are, uh, that be are ordained of God. Now speaking about governments here. Whosoever therefore resists the, the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a tire to good works, but to the evil. Now, if, if the rulers are a terror to good works, then you, get, you, need to, you need to overthrow that government. But for the most part, governments in the world uh, reward good behavior and they condemn and they punish bad behavior. That's why we have jails. That's why we have a peace officers to enforce those rules. For rulers are not a terror to the good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he, that is the government, and the minister of the government, he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. If you live in a country and you do wrong, you should be afraid of the government. You should be afraid of the police coming after you. Be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. Now, a sword is not for tickling you. It's not for just spanking you. The sword is for killing you. And the government has a responsibility, depending on the crime, to exact vengeance and the Bible says here, he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore, we must needs be subject, not only for wrath, not only for the punishment's sake, but as believers, also for conscience' sake. We want to be right with God and with man. We want to have a clear conscience that we're not out robbing and we're getting away with it. Well, you might get away with it, but God's watching and your conscience is defiled. But he says that, the government and those in powers, they burn out the sword in vain. They are the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath. We said this a few weeks ago, that, you know, death penalty is, is not for the purpose of reformation. Now, some things in jail, you know, uh, young people go wayward and there's, there's uh, programs in, uh, in the uh, correctional, correctional centers to correct your behavior and to change your direction of life. And sometimes that works. Many times it doesn't work. But there's some crimes that you can commit and correction has nothing to do with it. It's vengeance. It's paying the price that you owe to the society. You take someone's life, they're going to kill you. They should kill you. He's a revenger, a minister of God bringing vengeance, a revenger executing wrath on him that doeth evil. Now what is Israel doing right now? now I don't want to get into the whole section on this. But just to say this, that Israel has every right to go to the people who callously murdered men, women, and children and kill all of them. Yes. And I will tell you this, to talk about the, um, the, the innocent people, and I've, I've prayed for the innocent people in Palestine, and there, will, there are and there will be innocent people caught up in that. 
But I will tell you this, there's many people who are not in uniform, they're dressed as civilians. And these young people that, that followed the Hamas into uh, southern uh, Judea, and they went in and they looted and they raped and they killed and they behead, beheaded babies. And it was young fellas in tracksuits that went in to do that. The same ones that are going to be out on the street and, and the, 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 the world's press, all these innocent civilians, and many of them are just as bad as the people with the guns in their hands. And they voted them in, by the way. I'm not saying that there's people there that don't want Hamas. Hamas has just wrecked the, Ga the Gaza Strip. All of these Islamic jihadists uh, kill and destroy. They're a culture of death. And when they're in control of your, uh, your government, which is Hamas is the governing body in, Ga in, in the Gaza Strip, then um, it's just disaster for the people there. But I'm telling you, there's people there, not just ones in uniform, that deserve to die. And if Israel has anything to do with it, they will die. And I'm telling you this, they have every right to do that. Every right. And it's the only way that Israel can bring peace to its own borders. And if they're not strong, they're dead. Um, Golda Meir said, if the, if the Arabs laid down their arms, we would have peace. Or there would be, there'd be no more war, she said. And she said, if the Jews laid down their arms... There would be more, no more Jews. If Israel laid down their arms, there would be no more Israel. See, Israel has to lose one war. They have won every war that they've had. The War of Independence, the, the Six-Day War in 67, the War of Yom Kippur in 73. They've won every war that they've fought. They only have to lose one war, and it's over for them. This is an existential threat. Their existence depends on vanquishing their enemies. And it's biblical, it's right, because here with these slain people, they're crying, how long, O Lord, holy and true. God is holy, and God is true, and he's a God of justice. Justice will prevail. And let me tell you something. These two right here, Sharon and David and myself, grew up in Northern Ireland. We know what it is to live in Belfast and Northern Ireland, that live with injustice for 30 years, where people killed in cold blood, they were not brought to account. And my question was, if there's a God in heaven, can they not see what's going on? Can they not do something about this? But you know, there is a God in heaven. And judgment is coming. And there's not a terrorist in the world that will get away with it. Because when they die, they face a holy and true and righteous God. And he's a revenger upon their iniquity and their sin. And so, they cry. They cry for vengeance. They say, Lord, how long? They're impatient. There's probably people in Israel right now who have lost whole families. Whole families. The grandparents are left without children and grandchildren and they're crying out, how long? Till the blood of these innocent ones is avenged. See, there's something within, within all of us that desires that, that justice. That's a reflection of the nature of God. We've been made in his image. And it's, it's something that is Right. And when people in the world's press are talking about, you know, I'm going to get on this and I don't want to do it. But there's, there's injustice and there's false news. And it's a propaganda. I could tell you a whole lot more about that. And we've got to be discerning and thinking what is right, what is right. And no matter how hard it is, do what is right. Do what is right. It will all come out in the wash. And if you do what is right, then uh, it will be right in the end. Well, what are they told? They cry unto the Lord, and the Lord answers them back in verse number 11. First of all, he says in verse 11, And white robes were given unto them, uh, unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Now, first of all, we have this little phrase at the beginning of it, before they hear what they're told. It says that white robes were given unto every one of them. Now, these are souls under the altar in heaven. Now, the question is this. Can a spirit or a soul wear clothes? Now, that's a very interesting question. And to be honest with you, I don't know if I have the answer. And I've read several commentaries. don't think they have the answer either. I want you to look over at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 for just a moment. It just seems strange to me that, um, that, that spirits... Uh, can wear clothes, these white robes. These souls are robed with white robes. And the question is always, you know, asked, you know, we'll, we'll be able to know each other in heaven. Will we recognize each other in heaven? 
What will it be like when we go to heaven? Now we know that the Bible says the death is the soul departs from the body, as the you know the body without the spirit is dead. Um, so faith without works is dead. So the, the definition of death is when the spirit leaves the body, never to return. It's not a near death experience that the spirit leaves. Um, I remember when Rachel died. It said that you know she died in, in burying Benjamin. And it says that as her soul was in departing, for she died. The Bible says, uh, Paul says, um, uh, he says, to depart and to be with Christ is far better. You see, it's not that you have a soul. You are a soul. You have a body. The body is the house in which your soul lives. And you look through the, the eyes, the, the windows of your house right here. David talked about the windows of his house. That's his eyes. And some of us have double glazing. So we have, we have our windows and we have our glazing over our windows. And by the way, I think when we get our new bodies, we won't have the need of that. Um, so there's many things we don't understand. Uh, we know in part, but then shall we know even as also as we are known. But in 2 Corinthians, there's a, an interesting thing. Now, I'm not sure if I'll go along with this completely, but I, I thought I'd just throw this, this out to you. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, it says, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, what's that? That's your body. Yeah. We have a building of God, not a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. Now, this house is from earth. This is earthly. But the Bible says that every believer has a house that is from heaven. Now, originally, and I probably would still go along with this, that he's speaking about our glorified body. Our glorified body is a heavenly body. He talks about this in 1 Corinthians 15. But some people believe that there is an intermediate type of body that you have when your soul departs this body and you go to heaven, that somehow you have some sort of physical, it's not your glorified body, but it's some sort of temporary body that you live in until such time as uh, your physical body is, re is changed and glorified and resurrected and then your soul is reunited with that glorified body. So I don't know, but it's interesting that he talks about this. Um, verse 3, if so being that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. Uh, and I think the important thing about it is this. Is it's not when you die that you're just floating around in heaven. And uh, you know, people can look right through you. I mean, Jesus said that, he said, remember his resurrection, he says, don't be afraid. He says, a spirit hath not flesh and bones as he hath seen me of. He was physically resurrected in the physical body. Touch me and handle me, he says. Spirit doesn't have flesh and bones as you see me. But I, I wonder, is there the possibility that when, if we die before the rapture, that our soul goes to heaven, but somehow in heaven, our existence in heaven, is that we have hands and feet and eyes. I mean, think about the rich man and Lazarus. Send Lazarus that and he dipped the tip of his finger. Now, wait a minute, he just said that Lazarus was buried, the, dead, the, the, the rich man died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes. And, and of course at that time you had, uh, hell was a compartment. It was a waiting place. And even the saved people waited. They waited in paradise. And the rich man could look over in the paradise. Send Lazarus and he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I'm tormented in this flame. And Abraham says it's impossible. There's a great gulf fix. He can't go to you. You can't go to him. But he could see. And he said that, um, that he had a tongue. And he said that Lazarus had a finger. And yet we know that their bodies were... Do you see what I'm saying here? That somehow there's the possibility that even when we die and we go to be with the Lord, that we will still be able to have some sort of a physical aspect to us. And these souls then are able to put the white robes on whatever that entity may be. It's interesting also, you know, you've heard of... Um, is it ghost pains, I think, that people talk about? So if a person has his leg amputated, he doesn't have a right leg anymore. He's standing in a hospital, he's only got one leg, the right leg's gone. And his right foot is in pain. Or his right calf is itchy. And he's always experience of, of a, a body part that he doesn't have anymore. That's, that's kind of strange. Maybe it's all in your brain or whatever. But it's, it's interesting that, um, that there is that possibility. I'll tell you this, that when we go to heaven, there's no disappointment. Amen. You will know each other. You will rack it. You'll know more about each other then than you will now. We shall know even as also as we are known. There's no disappointments. You know, if I died when I'm 70, my grandchildren know me as an old man. 
when they die. <laughs> Thank you, brother. <laughs> Boy, the old ones are getting out tonight, aren't they? From between Jeremy and me. <laughs> Say I'm 95, is that good enough? 95. <laughs> Hope we hear don't, don't think I got any 95 year olds in here. Anyway, and uh, so they know me as a 90 full right, you know, an old person. And they have affection for my appearance as a 95 year old. So we all die, we're going the rapture. And uh, what does that mean? Am I still going to be 95 in heaven? Some people say, well, we shall be like Jesus. He died when he was 33 years old. Are we going to be like 30-something-year-olds with 30-year-old bodies? What is that going to look like? And to be honest, we don't know. What about if your baby dies? Are they going to be a baby in heaven? Um, and this has happened. We've, I've been asked these questions before, and they're very difficult. We don't have, really have the answers. And here's, here's the way I would, I would uh, explain that. First of all, there's no disappointments in heaven. So, you know, if I'm in heaven and I'm 30 years old, my kids are saying, here, you, where's my grandpa? It's almost like if, if we all died at the same time and they would, would, you, they would greet me as a, as a 95-year-old and then they would watch me get younger and younger and younger. Or you would meet your baby as a little baby and then you would see that baby grow older and older and older. I don't know if it's going to happen like that, but I know that we will know each other perfectly and our existence will be perfect and our body will be perfect. And our glorified body will be forever. Now, let's see what he says to them in verse number 11. So white robes were given unto them, every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren should be killed as they were, should be, should be fulfilled. Now, that's an amazing thing, isn't it? See, right here, I think we're at the, you know, I think chapter six, or the sixth seal, the seventh seal is, is really at the, at the middle of the tribulation period. I think these people were killed in the first half. The first three and a half years. But there's another three and a half years coming. And what the Lord says is rest. They're told to rest. Don't be anxious. Don't be in a hurry. For the vengeance of God. Because you know God says vengeance is mine. I will repay saith the Lord. You know what that means? It means that he repays in his time and in his way. There's still another three and a half years of this to go. And God will bring vengeance in, the, in, in his time um, and in the way that he decides he's in control of all of that judgment and our job is to trust him and to rest now, I want you to look at this look over look at back at the second Thessalonians chapter 1 second Thessalonians chapter 1 it says now this these are the believers who are undergoing persecuted they've, they've suffered injustice he says uh, verse number 4 of chapter 1 so that, ye, so that we ourselves glory in you and the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. So here's believers going through afflictions. They're being tormented. They're suffering injustice at the hands of unbelievers who are persecuting them. Verse 5 says, which is a manifest, manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer. In other words, God is watching and he's glorified if we will suffer in the right way for eternal things. Verse 6, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense, that means to repay, tribulation to them that trouble you. Trouble and tribulation, same thing. So God is going to trouble people who are troubling you. It's like I said this morning that God will punish the punishers. And he's going to bring tribulation to them that trouble you. God's going to repay. It's a recompense, verse 7. And to you who are troubled, notice these next three words, rest with us. You see, we're impatient. In Northern Ireland growing up, and we saw things that we didn't only want to explain to you. Every single day we saw things. There's always something in the news. Every week somebody got killed, somebody got blew up. Innocent people. And we're impatient. Lord, stop this. Fix it. Fix it now. And that night I went to church, I understood for the first time that God is going to fix it. He is, is going to bring judgment, but he comes in his time. And the God of all the earth and the judge of all the earth will do the right thing, but he will do it in his time. And what are we supposed to do to you your trouble? Rest with us. Verse 7. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven 
with his mighty angels. Now this is at the end of the tribulation, the second coming. Jesus is coming. Did you know that? And he's coming not with a not on a donkey, not on humility, but on, on a white horse. He's coming in power and glory to judge and make war. He's not coming as the Savior. If you're not saved when he comes, you're not going to get saved. He's coming as the judge. Verse 8. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Some people say, well, um, uh, putting space in here is something that's illegitimate. In other words, the rapture and the second coming has to be the same thing. I don't understand that. He says wait, he says rest. And so we can rest and be taken in the rapture with the known fact that seven years after the rapture, the Lord Jesus is coming and he's going to judge those people. It's interesting if you go back to chapter 6, um, we, we didn't point this out, but he says, they said, um, How long dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? In other words, these people who have died, the people who killed them are still alive. So this is not speaking of historical martyrs of the Christian church over the last 2,000 years. This is something that happens in the tribulation period, and their persecutors are still alive. And so the message to them, though, is to wait. Now, another reason they had to wait was that the other martyrs would join them as the tribulation progressed. He said, uh, you've got to rest a little season, three and a half years, until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Now, I will say this. I've got to hurry here. Um, in the tribulation, martyrdom. So he's talking about these in the first half. He talks about those who will be killed in the second half. In the tribulation, martyrdom is a very common occurrence. Look over at Matthew 24 for just a moment. In verse 21 and 22. He says, <clears throat> and we've quoted this tonight already. For then shall be great tribulation. Now, when is he talking about? Well, that goes back up to uh, verse 15. When he talks about the abomination of desolation spoken by the prophet Daniel. So that's in Daniel 9 and verse 27. When the Antichrist breaks the covenant in the middle. He comes into Jerusalem. Into the temple. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Sets himself up as God. And that's when he starts really persecuting. Again we saw that in Revelation chapter 12. So he says in verse 21. For then shall be great tribulation. Such as was not since the beginning of the world of this time. No nor ever shall be. Now he's speaking about specifically here. The, the, the wrath of the Antichrist upon the Jewish people. It's going to be the worst time ever. Worse than Hitler. Six million people dying. Worse than that. And so we mentioned this already today. But in the, first, in the second world war. There was uh, in the 1930s. There was 18 million Jews. And Hitler slaughtered a third of them. Six million. Today there is um, about 14, maybe 15. So they're still not even back up to what they were before the Holocaust. They had 18 million. Now they're at about 15 million. And in, in, in Zechariah chapter 13, it says that two thirds will die. Well, how many would that be if there's 15 million? If it happened today, then that would be 10 million would die and 5 million would survive. So that would be 10 million is more than 6 million, right? We'll see what Jesus is saying here in verse 21. Uh, during that future, at the abomination of desolation, that future tribulation, it's the worst time ever. Never been a time like it until this time, nor never after. And it says in verse 22, And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. And the elect, of course, are those who are saved in the tribulation period. In other words, if God didn't intervene, nobody, no, no believer at all, would survive the tribulation. That's what I'm saying. Church wouldn't go through the tribulation. Church would die in the tribulation. But the truth is we're rescued out of the world before the tribulation begins. And so martyrdom is a very common thing. And if I wasn't saved, knowing what I know, I wouldn't take another breath. I wouldn't take another step. I would fall on my knees right now and I'd get saved. Because not only could I die and go to hell if I wasn't saved, right here on the spot I could take an aneurysm, I could take a heart attack, and it would be an eternity if I wasn't saved. But not only that, if the rapture happened, my, I'm, my, my doom is sealed. And not only that, but I would die in the tribulation period. And so 
It's an unprecedented period of time. Well, let's move on then to verse number 12 through 17, and we'll be a little quicker on this section. So that's the fifth seal. The fifth seal is the cry of the martyrs. There's many, many believers that will die in the tribulation period. It's normal. Just as it's maybe not normal in this age, it's the normal thing in the tribulation time. Who want to go through that? No. So in verse 12 through verse 17, we have now the sixth seal. Now there's seven seals in all. The seventh one we be, we'll look at in chapter 8. So this is the sixth seal. And the sixth seal is the sign of the Messiah. That's what I've called it. Now I have to say that the sixth seal is the hardest of the seals to interpret. And I'll tell you why. Because it's so similar that it causes us to consider it as the second coming. They say, what are you talking about? Well, let's look at verse number 12. He says, And I beheld, and when it opened the sixth seal, and though there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of her, the moon became as blood, the stars of heaven fell unto the earth. Now, let me stop right there. If one star fell upon the earth, do you know how big stars are? You know, they're bigger than our sun, most of them, right? So there wouldn't be an earth, right? So you understand that the word star there is aster, aster, A-S-T-E-R, in Greek it's aster. And so that's where we get the word asteroid from. Okay, so a star, an aster, can also be an asteroid. Now, the science community is very, very fearful about these things because there are asteroids floating around in our solar system. Some of them we know, some of them they're tracking, some of them come very, very close to the Earth. I mean, they've made movies about this, about going out in a spacecraft and blowing up this asteroid before it hits the Earth. The Bible says that's actually going to happen during this time of judgment. There's asteroids that will fall out of the heavens through our atmosphere and survive the fall. And by the way, we're going to get into some of these, the, um, the, 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 second, the second trumpet judgment. Uh, which is in chapter 8. Uh, look at chapter 8, verse 8. The second angel sounded, and there, uh, as it were, a great burning mountain uh, with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became his blood. Now, that's, that's not actually what I'm thinking about. Um, the the uh, Verse 10, the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, again, asteroid, burning, as it were, a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the waters and upon the fountains of the waters. The name of the water, the star is called Wormwood. The star, this asteroid has a, a name. Uh, wormwood. Do you know what the, the word Wormwood means in Russian? Chernobyl. Look it up in your dictionary. What, is, what does Cherno Chernobyl mean in your dictionary? Google it. It means Wormwood. Is there a connection here? You'll have to come back. <laughs> when we get to chapter 8. Okay, I'm just simply saying, because people, what are you talking about? The stars, stars are going to fall from heaven on the earth. Okay, asteroids are, that's asters, okay. So, in verse, uh, uh, verse 13, the stars of heaven fell onto the earth, even as a fig tree cast their ultimate uh, untimely figs, and she shall be shaken of the mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it was rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their place. Now, when you look at this, you're thinking to yourself, that's what he talked about in Matthew 24. Look at Matthew 24. He said in Matthew 24 and verse 29, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be dark, and the moon shall not give her light. The stars shall fall from heaven. The powers of the heaven shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Now that happens after the tribulation. So what you have described here in chapter 6 is almost identical to what's going to happen at the very, very end. But this is not the end. This is like in the middle. Now that's why it's hard to... To interpret this, because some people will look at that and say, "Well, that's that's the second, that's got to be the second coming." Well, what's the second coming doing in chapter uh, six in the sixth seal? Because you've got the seventh seal, and out of the seventh seal comes seven trumpet judgments, and out of the seventh trumpet judgment is the seven seal judgments. You got all these future judgments ahead of what we find in the sixth seal. So why is this? At, was he is he talking about the end when you got all these other things that take place first before the end? And so it's difficult. And some people have, I think, went astray on this. Now, the thing that helped me is I agonized over this. And sometimes you have to agonize over scriptures. And it's like detective work. You're looking for clues. And there are differences in this 
compared to Matthew 24, what we just read. What are the differences? Well, let's go back here and look at verse 15. It says, And the kings of the earth, and the great men, the rich men, the chief captains, mighty men, and so on, um, hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains. So when the sixth seal happens and the, 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 the sun is darkened and the moon becomes blood and these asteroids are hitting the earth and there's great earthquake, um, the, all, the, all the people of the earth, big and small, great and um, not so great, they're hiding in the caves of the earth. They're running from this, this, this scene that they're seeing. Because um, he says that, the, uh, that the, 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 the heaven, verse 14, the heaven departed as a scroll, as it is rolled together in every mountain and island. So the heaven is rolled together as a scroll. Now we talked about this before, where is heaven? You have the first heaven, which is the atmosphere. Second heaven, outer space. Third heaven. You know, the third heaven is so far away, you couldn't be able to hear anything, yet people heard God out of heaven. They couldn't see anything, but Stephen could see Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father, that heaven was opened. So how can you see into something that is billions and billions and trillions of light years away? How, how can you hear anything from something that is way out there? And what I've concluded is that heaven is not way out there. Of course, and I don't want to get into it, because I'm not a, you know, I went fishing instead of taking math class, so I'm not very good at any of that. But, you know, there is string theory and different, uh, the theory of relativity where they, they, they think that there is a fourth dimension. That the universe is not just, you know, linear, but you can go from one point of the, the vast universe in a very small distance of time. It's kind of like it's, I don't know. You'll have to look. But what I'm saying is it is a scientific possibility that there's a fourth dimension. And usually the door of heaven is closed and we can't see that fourth dimension. But there are times when God opens it and he lets us see right into heaven. I think that's what happens. I think that's what happens here. And so when they see the scene of the uh, heaven open, what do they see? Well, look at verse um, the last part of verse, or verse 16 says, They said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne. And from the wrath of the Lamb. So the person that they're dealing with. Where is he? He's in heaven. What's he doing? He's sitting on a throne. What are they doing? They're hiding themselves from that vision. In verse 17 they say. For the great day of his wrath has come. And who shall be able to stand? Now the difference between this. And the second coming. In Revelation chapter 19. Well let's look at Revelation 19. Again we see heaven opened. Verse 11, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. This is Jesus, the second coming. Coming not on a donkey, but on a white horse. Now, <clears throat> when the great men and the, and, uh, the, you know, uh, the great men and the kings of the earth and the rich men and chief captains and so on, when they see uh, Jesus in chapter 6, he's not on the horse. Where is he? He's on the throne. And in chapter 6, they're not coming out to meet him. They're not coming out to fight him. What are they doing? They're hiding themselves. But when you come to chapter 19, when they look up, they see Jesus on the white horse, that he's coming. And not only that, they're not hiding from Jesus at a second coming. They're there to fight with him. And in fact, if you look down to verse 18, it says that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, mighty men, horses, them that sit on them, flesh of all men, both... Uh, Free and bonds, both small and green. But they had come, verse 19, saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against them that sat upon the horse and against this army. So these are subtle differences, but I think they're very important differences. You say, well, what really is the significance then of this sixth scene? Well, the significance of it is this. First of all, this is a sign to the world of what is now coming in the seventh seal. See the seventh seal is where really. Because when you think about it. The four horsemen of the apocalypse. Is God's hand of judgment in any one. Well you could say generally he was. It's the antichrist coming. In diplomacy. You have the armies of the world that are fighting with one another. As a result of that there's famine in the land. As a result of that there's death. A quarter of the world's population die. But is God's hands directly involved in that judgment like he is in all of these other judgments? No. But when you get to seal 6, this is a sign that the day of judgment has arrived. And God is directly going to orchestrate 
the, the next judgments, the seven seal, the seven trumpet judgments, the seven bowl judgments. He is going to personally orchestrate that. Angels come. He's directing the angels with the bowls, the poor light, and all the, the trumpet judgment. The, the angels blow the trumpets in heaven and things happen on the earth. This is the hand of God's righteous judgment upon the earth. And not the seal six that hasn't happened. Seal five is about, about the martyrs. God didn't kill the martyrs. But it's the cry of the martyrs. Crying out for justice. Crying out for vengeance. And then God says open seal six. And when the, the sixth seal is opened. And it's all read out. It, and I think the second thing here is that. It's a token to the martyrs. Of the fifth seal. That the Lord who is holy and true. Is going to judge and avenge. And when the sixth seal is opened. Basically God says it started. It started. And people see it and it scares the life out of them and they're hiding them. They're not one to fight anybody. In fact, in Joel, <clears throat> you'll find this in Joel chapter 3, verse 9 through 12, that God actually has to um, command the people of the worlds to come. Coming to, let's just look at that. Uh, look at Joel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum. Daniel, Hosea, Joel chapter 3. And look at verse number 9. He says, Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. Prepare war. Now this is the battle of Armageddon. He's calling. Now we know that the Antichrist orchestrates this. And in their minds they're coming to Jerusalem to clean it, to wipe it out. Isn't it interesting that Israel is always in the middle of this stuff? I mean someone once said if an alien dropped on a, 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 in a spaceship and, and landed in our backyard and read the newspaper they said you know why why is this one people group going through so much through all these millennia why is that you know it's just strange isn't it it has to occur even to the non-believer what is it about Israel that attracts all this 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 uh, this hate and this it's 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 beyond human reason because it is it's it's satanic is what it is there is an enemy who hates them and it, it pops its heads up in every generation. Anyway, verse 9 says, Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles, prepare war. Wake up the mighty men, all, let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares uh, and the swords. Now we know in Isaiah chapter 2 that the opposite is true. When Jesus comes, sets up his kingdom, he says they'll take their swords and they'll beat them into plowshares. They'll take their, um, uh, what is it, their, their swords and their, what is it? Spears and the pruning hooks. So they take their instruments of war, melt them down, make farming implements. So there's going to be lots of farming in the Millennial Kingdom, but there'll be no more war. Not war. And for now, I should say, we're in the kingdom. Are you joking me? In Revelation 20, it says that Satan is bound for thought. They said, and they literally will tell you this, that Satan is bound right now. Are you joking me? The Bible says there will be no more. They will not, uh, they will learn no more war. There will be no hurt in my holy mind. When Jesus comes, there's peace on earth, goodwill toward men. That hasn't happened yet. But here's, before that happens, here's what he encourages them to do. He says, take your farming implements, uh, uh, your farming implements and make instruments of war out of them. He says, I'm calling you to a fight. This is the Antichrist and all the God haters, the enemies of God. He's saying, come on. You want to fight? Let's fight. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Some people, there's actually a Christian song about let the weak say, I am strong. That's not the context. This is speaking about unbelievers. He says, you're unbelievers. You feel like you're weak. Consider yourself strong. Come out to meet me. We're going to have a war. We're going to have a battle. Verse 11. Assemble yourselves and come, all ye heathen, and gather yourselves to gather round about. Thither cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Let the heathen be wakened. And come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. Put ye in the sickle for the harvest is ripe. Come get you down for the press is full. The fat's overflow. Remember we talked about the valley of Jehoshaphat. Isn't there today. But when Jesus comes. Zechariah chapter 14. And the Mount of Olives is divided. Half goes toward the north. Half the goes. And so there's a valley. That goes from Jerusalem. Right down into the Jordan Valley. That's the wine press. He's talking about put the sickle in. For the harvest is ripe. Multitudes, verse 14, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon shall be darkened. The stars shall withdraw their shining. This is the second coming. Verse 16, and the Lord also shall roar out of Zion. And now see right now, God is silent. Does another thing. 
This is the day of grace, man's day. But the day of the Lord is coming and everything's going to change. And the Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth shall shake. But the Lord, thank God, the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. Say, well, God's free with Israel. The church is now Israel. No, 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 no. You see how simple it is? Just take the Bible literally. This is speaking about, this is speaking about the second coming. And that what I'm saying is, in, 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 a, in a Revelation chapter 6, in the sixth seal, the people are hiding themselves. But here, at the, at the second coming, they're not hiding. God calls them out to this battle, the battle of Armageddon, and he will defeat all of his enemies. And so the significance of the sixth seal <clears throat> is this is a sign to the world of what is now coming. Because after the sixth seal, it's a token um, and many that seen disasters happen in the sixth seal, but it's a, a precursor, it's a picture, it's a pattern of what's going, going to take place in these judgments when God has his hand upon it. And uh, what they say is that the day, that great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? And the answer to that question is nobody. Nobody. I don't care who you are, how important you are, how powerful you are, how rich you are. Nobody will be able to stand. Only those who know Christ as their Savior are the only ones who will be able to stand in that day. And so the tribulation is an unprecedented period of time in world history. And it hasn't happened yet. And you know, if you keep coming on, on Sunday nights and we could continue to go through, because we're not even, I mean, this is, the seal six is just the introduction. Seal seven opens up all the different judgments. And we're going to look at them in detail and see what it might mean to this planet. But see the time we're through with this, 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 this series, you're not going to want to go through the tribulation. No, you, nobody wants to go through the tribulation. Maybe you're here tonight and say, I don't want to go through the tribulation. Well, here's the answer to that. Receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and you will not go through the tribulation. Because he says that Christ, we wait for his Son from heaven, who has delivered us from the wrath to come. For God has not appointed us unto wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. We are not of the night, we're not of the judgment, we're of the day. We come back with the day star, the bright and morning star. When Jesus comes after the night of the, the, the first part of the day of the Lord, all Jewish days start at night. And when Jesus comes in the dawning hours, we come with him. And we are the children of the day to enjoy the millennial kingdom after God judges his enemies in this period of time called the tribulation. The seven scenes. It's the title deed to the earth. And as he opens each one of those scenes, he's reclaiming what belongs to him. And God is the one who decides how the world is going to end. He's the one that decides how Jesus will come and what he will do when he does come. And we would be wise to read what he says and take warning and get ready. And the only way you can be ready is to have Jesus Christ as your Savior. Friend, if you're here tonight or maybe you're watching and you're not saved, if you're here, certainly, stay behind. And, you know, um, we are very easy people to talk to. And uh, if you're concerned about your salvation, even if you think you are saved, but you're just doubting it, but you want to have that peace, let that's, that's somebody talk to you. I can talk to you. There's other there's men here. There's women that can speak to you tonight. Just stay behind for a few minutes. Let someone speak to you so that you know for sure that you're going to miss this period of time. Jesus is the only Savior and the only way. Father, we...